All right, everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm really happy to have Brett Appley on here. Um, so just to give you guys kind of a heads up, as, as usual, what I'd like to do is kind of share with all of you guys what, what people I listen to and what my process is in all of my research, whether it be basketball, baseball, and MMA, NASCAR, whatever. And Brett, quite honestly, is someone I've been following for, you know, since I started uh, playing MMA. I think I, I first found him, um, he did a, like kind of a free YouTube video for another site or one of the, like the big, the big, the big uh, connections, I guess, um, where he would do a, uh, a cash game play of the week, a, a tournament play of the week and a fade of the week. And it was really just like, it was, a, it was an interesting part of my process to see what he would talk about because he's a very calming way of communicating and you can tell that he puts a lot of thought into it. And then I noticed that he, has a site uh, of his own, uh, Daily Fan MMA or Daily MMA Fan, Daily Fan MMA. Correct. Where yeah. I originally had thought that it was completely dedicated to MMA, um, and it turns out it's actually they they have a lot more going on there, which begs the question why keep the name the way it is. But that's a, that's another business decision. Um, so just just um, for pure disclosure, again, I'm a 100% a paid member of Daily uh, Fan MMA. Uh, I don't get anything from this. He's not getting anything from this either. But for, from you, from your perspective, again, you guys always ask, what do I do? How do I win? What, who do I listen to? So I'd like to bring those people on and, and, and ask them questions. I mean, not necessarily about the slate. I mean, whatever. But listen, I, one of the things I am, I'm very protective of how hard it is to do this work. And I, I fully believe that all DFS content providers are underpaid. Um, I don't really do this expecting money. I do this really for fun. And, and I think that people that play for enough money that, that subscribe to these places, they should be paying a lot more. That's just my own opinion. Um, but because there's so many of them, I mean, they're, they're, everybody's just forced to charge not that much. Um, so, so we're not, I'm not going to see you guys. I'm not, we're not going to go through like all the, all the picks and whatever it is. Cause you want to know what he has a site that he, that he, he pass, he protects his YouTube videos with his full site breakdown for only paid members. So we're, we're, we're not going to do that. I mean, I'll ask him maybe some general things about maybe some parts of the slate, but I'm more interested in talking about about MMA DFS in general. And I have just some overarching questions for him. Do me a favor, give give me a brief history, I guess, of 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 where you came from and how Daily uh, Daily Fan MMA got started. And then I'll just get into it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Um, man, I, I I would say all all of this started from just my actual passion for for sports and competing i mean i was competing in, in soccer throughout my entire life up until college age where essentially like i just realized i wasn't like big enough or strong enough and my my dream of being a professional athlete didn't really didn't really work out there and eventually i stumbled upon jujitsu in college where like i quickly realized that it kind of just matters how much you know and for someone who's not the biggest or, or strongest person i'm like well i can outwork a lot of these other guys and I just got into this grind just became obsessed with jujitsu and that I mean changed my life in a lot of ways I could go down a tangent there but um it, it really started from from grinding jujitsu that, that led me into watching the UFC and simultaneously in college I was working to be a sports writer because I wanted to tie sports into my career into my life in some way and I'm pretty good at writing I like helping people so um I had a journalism background and then, you know, right place, right time. Uh, I'm on draft street before DraftKings ever comes around. I'm on Roto grinders before an MMA product is ever launched. DraftKings launches their MMA product in, in 2015. And I'm looking around the room. No one, no one wants to write about MMA contests or like 40, 50 people wide. Everyone wants to be an NFL tout. And so I, I knew more about the process of MMA and, and, um, I felt I could communicate well enough to put out a blog. I started writing. Eventually, I was hired by Roto Grinders after like a year or so writing on their site for free. I worked for Roto Grinders for a couple of years and then just expanded out on my own. So been out on my own the last couple of years. DailyFanMMA.com is my site. Like you said, we, we recently did bring on a, a NASCAR writer, a person I've known for a long time. But um, yeah, our primary focus is MMA, and I'd say that's the that's the very brief version of of how the site came to be. Let me ask you, um, you yourself, do you do you? Um, I asked you this before offline. Whatever, do you 
do you bet on MMA? Do you play D MMA DFS? Do you do both? I mean, it's so hard to do content and play. Um, yeah. But but do you do both both ends of it, uh, both the betting part and the DFS part? Yeah, I do. I mean, I and, and I grew my my DFS bankroll originally at the very beginning playing cash games and in, in daily fantasy MMA. There's only five fighters. It, it was not that hard, and it's the game's gotten a lot harder. The betting side. I also think there's an edge to be had on the betting side, especially compared to you look at markets like the NFL or MLB or whatever. It's, it's very, very difficult to get any edge on an, an NFL spread, but there's just not as much data in MMA. So the edges are greater. And the unfortunate part for me specifically, I live in California. Betting is not legal here, so I don't have access to as many books. So I have to, you know, I have to do different things to, to get around that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, bet every week um well, i play dfs every week and yeah. i do my best to provide content well let me let me let me let me start with that then because for those of you i mean everybody knows this already but i'm a hedge fund guy and 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 i'm also kind of a typically an efficient market theory guy when it comes to to stock market investing the idea being is that for the most part most of most of the prices in stocks are already priced in all the information available and to get an edge, you have to be factoring in stuff that is not being adequately compensated for. And it's, and it's difficult, right? And, and you have the stock market, which is the most liquid market in the world with billions and billions and trillions of dollars in it. So you know that it's, it's completely liquid and all the information is sort of being priced in to some degree. Um, and then you get into, like you were saying, the NFL and, and, and then you have an extremely liquid market, right? With, with a lot of people pricing stuff in. And then you get to MMA, which is a little less so. Like you said, you have less data, it's whatever, um, and it's less liquid. But the problem is, in my head, is that you, you pay for that by having these 30 cent vigs, right? So, so, so MMA, you know, no matter you know, look, you could do a lot of price shopping or whatever. But the fact is, is that it's not like the stock market. Your your vig is like is like one penny. You know what I mean? That's why you have to pay for your share to, to try to realize your edge. NFL, you know, you could probably get a minus 105, minus 105. But in, in, in MMA, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So, you know, I guess my first question, and there's a reason I ask is, is how much, I would say how much is no number, but like, is there, is there an edge, right? Like in, in MMA wagering, I know a lot of people do it and a lot of people tout and a lot of people, and listen, you can bet without having an edge. Like it's fun. You know what I mean? Like you can, you could totally do that. And, and there will be these independent tracking sites that, that get a lot of business from people that want to, and obviously the way survivorship bias works is an amazing thing. You know what I mean? Like you get the top 10 guys that, that, that have their top 10. Now they get to say they're the best when it's very just possible that they were just the top 10 who ran hot over the, over that year or something like that. Um, I, I guess, I, don't, I guess I don't need an actual answer to the question, but, but is there like an edge to betting like in MMA? I mean, everyone wants to think that there is, right? I like to think that there is. And for me, it's more about my process than anything. I think my process leads me to evaluating fighters in a better method than the vast majority of the market. And I've done, I mean, I've given away like my secrets. I've, I've done videos on this. And essentially my process it revolves around like wh which fighters can control where the fight takes place. Can you produce enough offense per round to win rounds? And understanding the ground game and kind of the intricacies of that is pretty important where I, I think a lot of people, you know, they're, they're still using how many ranked wins does a fighter have to evaluate? They're just using how much knockout power does a fighter have? And like those things, I, I there's a lot of noise in, in the MMA space that I think leads to lines that are relatively um, soft. And of course, I, I'm not pretending that I, you know, I can return 50% ROI or anything like that over the course of a season. It's still very difficult, but um, I think the process I use has helped me profit over the long run. And I, I still think it's an area where the majority of the market is, is not quite there yet. Well, well, it's funny over the past four weeks, I put out my, I put, I finally did. I put out betting videos and, and, and my betting videos will, I mean, you, it'll drive people to the lunatic asylum, watch my betting videos. Cause what I do, is basically the same thing I do with the stock market is I I presume to know nothing about the ground game and nothing about jujitsu. I look at the odds, presume they're somewhat efficient, and then try to figure out what of that line has been driven by BS. You know, what of that line is driven by by 
by recency bias. And I'll like go for a line and say, oh, my God, I can't believe that I'm seeing 30 people. They all tout this one guy. And yet he's only minus 140. You know, I'll just take the other person. I don't even care who he is, you know, and and it's it's kind of funny, the stuff that, that I come up with. And I literally I recommend something every single every single fight, one unit like, across the board. And it's it's really fun you know, just to kind of like try to get into the market's head that way, you know, and it, and that is kind of fun. The reason why I bring all this up is because and I the reason why I make it totally different. And, you know, betting versus the best video is the overarching assumption of betting on MMA is that there's something wrong with the line in some way, you know? And to some degree, the overarching assumption when you play DFS is that the lines are efficient, right? That's what most people, you know, that's what you do. Like you say, okay, this is the, the, the inside the distance prop of a guy who's X, Y, Z to win based on the implied odds suggested by Vegas. And then it doesn't take, I don't want to say it doesn't take a genius, but, then you derive projections and you derive uh, things as a result of it. And, and where you get your edge in DFS, if you presume that the lines are efficient, and as a result, probably the projections are somewhat efficient, is, is knowing how to play the ownership and leverage game and, and how to build portfolio of good plays as opposed to just, just figuring out, you know, just playing all the good plays. And I always, and we've talked about this offline once before, like, if you could ever really combine the two disciplines, like if you could really have an edge in, in, in betting and then thus apply that to DFS, I mean, maybe that's what the best players do do. You know what I mean? And, and, and so it's funny because I was, I wanted to have these other like betting guys on my show and I was going to even join them, but they're not interested in DFS. And I hear, I see one of them says, Oh, well, this inside the distance prop is terrible. I'm betting this guy to finish. Well, why don't, instead of doing that, you know, why don't we just like bet him in DFS? You know what I mean? Why why don't we right. bet a low owned 92, a, a low owned guy that, that you think the inside the distance prop is wrong. And then it gets back to the discussion we had offline before is, is wouldn't it be cool to figure out if you have an opinion on something, what is the best avenue to, 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 to profit off of that? So um, I, I, I don't know. I just find that, that, that piece of it, like really interesting. Let, let me, let me ask you, I'll, I asked this of all of the, people of, I don't want to say niche sports, but of like different sports. So based on your knowledge and based on your experience dealing with DFS players in general, okay? Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say what's the biggest mistake people make. That's 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 a little too easy. I'll, I'll put it to you another way. What type of chalk, let's put it this way, in, in DFS MMA is the good chalk? I and mean, yeah, listen, I know... Slate dependent, all that good stuff, right? But what type of chalk is considered by you? Yeah, maybe the overall chalk, and which type of chalk is usually the good chalk? I mean, this is a pretty easy question for me because it comes down to the process of the the way that I evaluate fighters. I'm yeah. always going to be underweight on chalk where a fighter doesn't wrestle, they don't throw many strikes per minute. But they have this crazy knockout power. They've had a couple recent wins by knockout. They're going to be 40% owned because now they're fighting someone weak. And theoretically, they're likely to win by knockout. Or I just don't think the public understands how hard it is to win by knockout. Like the, the, the timing, the accuracy, the speed, the durability is like so incredibly, it's such an incredibly high variance sport striking exchanges that I find you know, people overestimate the chance for fighters to win by KO. And of course you want to be exposed to fighters who are going to win inside the distance, but that type of chalk, I'm almost always underweight on. And sometimes it, it, it burns me because obviously they're, they could be a big favorite for a reason. On the other side, the chalk that I typically like is fighters who have shown consistent volume wrestling, a guy who, you know, they're going out there, they're attempting 12 takedowns and in a good matchup, I don't care if they're they're popular or not. If, if I can project them to attempt 12 takedowns, I can project project them to land four to five. With those four to five, they're going to earn X amount of control. They're going to land X amount of non-significant strikes. It's going to get, you know, based on the intricacies that I know on the ground, maybe they can advance position. Maybe they can find a path to a submission on the ground. That's a much lower variance art form. Jiu-Jitsu is, is much lower variance. So that's the type of chalk that I always gravitate toward because it's more consistent. I know what I'm getting where there, there's just such a wide range of outcomes in striking. It's 
high variance, and I think it's overestimated by the public. What's cool about um, about uh, DFS in general, and with respect to uh, sports like this and tennis with binary outcomes, right, wins and losses and stuff like that, is that you have to take some underdogs every single slate, right? And, and yes, you can you can get there with 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 losses, but it's rare. Actually, the last two two slates that have been won by uh, someone with a loss. You I know, right? <laughs> Gordon, and the, I think I think uh, Natividad was in was in the winner. I think uh, I think it was Natividad stacked with with whoever with Tercios. I think mm-hmm. ended up winning, which is very very rare. Um, so when you deal with these underdogs, and this is kind of actually relevant to, to this week's slate, is sometimes you think they do it on purpose, but they don't. Sometimes you have the the, the, the underdogs being those guys that are like two to one to win or two to one to lose, but they have this sort of KO upside, right? That that they're oh, they're plus three to one inside the distance, and like if they win, you know they have the KO upside, and you have to pick between your your favorite of these awful 7,200 guys with KO upsides. And, and then some slates like this one, this week, you have just a slew of like wrestlers, like throughout the slate, you know, like when I, when I first looked at this particular slate, I was like, okay, there's only two guys with an inside the distance prop of, of better than pick them. Right. You have Alice a. Chuck and, and, and Albazi. And then everybody else is, 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 is under, is under even money. And then even the 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 underdogs, you don't really have anybody that has that KO upside, but all of them, not all of them, but a decent amount of them have this wrestling upside. So it's it becomes like real a really, really cool slate. And to be able to to figure out how those two blend together is really interesting. I, you know, I will give you I'll give I'll give you one one thing that always just kind of gets me, not gets me. So I want to compare three guys from this from this week. I want to compare Alizé Chuck, Tap, and Morozov, okay? And, and I'm going to do this for a reason. So they're, two of them are the same, and one of them is different as far as I'm concerned. So you have Alizé Chuck and, and Cobb that you have Alizé Chuck was one of the aforementioned guys I mentioned who's got an inside distance prop of better than Pickham, right? And yeah. he's uh, similarly priced to Cobb, maybe a little more expensive. You have Cobb, who is a little less expensive, uh, excuse me, a little less, little worse of an inside the distance prop. And as a result, maybe not as a result, but maybe by accident, he's also, he's a little less expensive. Okay. And the thing is, I talked about projections is you have these two guys who are the same. Now, when I say the same, I mean that I think that whatever projections there are, are going to be probably efficient. You know what I mean? Like, like there, one guy's going to have a little bit better inside the distance prop. And they're a little bit more expensive. And so they're probably going to be owned commensurate, you know what I mean? Like with, with that whole thing. But on the other hand, you have Morozov, who's in a similar price range, but his price and his projection is more, it has almost very little to do with his inside the distance problem, but it has some, right? He's, what is he, plus 250 or something like that. But he's got this wrestling upside, right? And to, how do you, I, I know it depends, but, but, what what do you do in a situation like this? You know, for, for me, like, well, there, there was one difference I would say between those first two guys. Um, one of them, like Cop, no one's playing his opponent. Like he's, Devorah is going to be like 0% owned, where it's yeah. possible that Brundage gets a little bit of, a little bit of ownership. So I guess to compare the two, you could say that Alice Agent might be better because he may have some leverage over the more yeah. popular underdog, I guess. And, and and more and more is up. Probably no one's gonna play, no one's gonna play Newsom. Like I, again, I I didn't want to put Albazi in the same category with Morozov because Albazi's kind of got that combination of both, but he's way expensive. Like how do you usually deal with 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 the difference between guys like this that are that are KO but a good KO up a good KO prop and and eh, fishy but he has that wrestling. Yeah, I mean, the answer is that it's really hard. It's really hard to decipher. I would say, like, in this particular instance, I'm going to look at, you know, Morozov's fighting journey nuisance. So, like, you know, we project uh, Morozov for some wrestling upside, but, like, what exactly is his wrestling upside? What exactly can he do on the ground? It is kind of an impossible question to answer, but, like, I know that Newsom is he's either a brown belt or a black belt now in jiu-jitsu. We saw his UFC debut in which he gave up a few takedowns to Ricardo Ramos, who is a very, very good submission grappler. He gave up some really bad positions. 
and survived. So it's a case where for me in, in that particular matchup, I look at Morozov and think that he can probably land takedowns. I mean, he can probably have a path to a dominant position. He doesn't stand out as someone who's extremely likely to win inside the distance for me because I've already seen Newsom in bad positions against a good opponent and survive. So if he was fighting a worse opponent who I look through, you know, I look through his history, it's like he got submitted here, he got submitted there, he got submitted there. I might rate Morozov a little bit higher than I would in this particular matchup. And then uh, Alexichuk and Kopp, they're very boomer bust. Neither guy is going to score very well without a knockout, in my opinion. They're the types that I kind of tend to be underweight on, like I already talked about. Alexichuk, it kind of, I mean, there it kind of comes down to inside distance, right? I mean, Alexichuk is more likely to win inside the distance than Cop, And also, he may be lower owned than Cop. I haven't done my ownership projections either. yet, but... I would guess Albazi is going to be very, very popular. He's going to be a priority in that range for a lot of people. And if you're, you're probably not playing Alexichuk and Albazi together on a large percentage of lineup. So Alexichuk at minus 145 inside the distance or whatever he is, if he is going to be lower owned comparatively to someone like Albazi, he just stands out as a good kind of pivot in that range where cop cop is just kind of, you know, someone who I may want exposure to for the theoretical inside the distance, but not a guy who I'm ever going to take a stand on, especially in, in smaller divisions. That's another thing. Uh, Alexia Chick Brundage, it's what, 185? They're, they're big hitters where typically fights in those divisions and inside the distance at a higher rate. I know that's baked into the odds, but um I'm going to be a little bit more inclined to to back those fights than 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 flyweights. Well, you know, well, that's real. That's really interesting what you, you're saying because again, I'm trying to like incorporate like actual knowledge of the game, right? With with these numbers, and so I'm just going to throw names out there just to, like as an example. I mean, when when you take like a a, a Fakradinov, yeah, right, for open, yeah. For open. So let's take Fakradinov, uh, Garcia, Kakramanov. Win, yeah. uh, what's her name? Yeah. Uh, McKenna, right? Yeah, we'll, yeah. Throw, we'll throw, we'll throw, uh, uh, Rosas, uh, uh, Rosa in there as well, but not as much. So, are you able, like for me, I like to see all these five wrestlers, whatever. Oh, I'm just yeah. gonna pick a pool with them, whatever. Are you good in not? I don't want to agree or everything, but is there like a difference between those guys? You know what I mean? Like, yes, to me, they're yeah, all yeah. the same. You know, it's a wrestler with upside if they win, good win condition, let's go. But yeah. based on your like, actual knowledge of, of the way jujitsu and the way wrestling works, does, does one of them like just feel like different to you in some way? Well, for example, the Garcia versus Mahashate fight is interesting because there, there's almost no footage on Mahashate, especially grappling. So we, we just don't know. And the vast majority of the time when we don't know, the answer is not going to be a good one. So and, and it's, it's such <laughs> good one a, for a good one for whom, though? For the fighter who doesn't have the grappling footage. Okay. And okay. and perhaps 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 he just goes out there and knocks Garcia out. But if I had to bet, I would bet on the side of a fighter who I know is going to go out there consistently wrestle, is pretty decent quality in Garcia against someone we just don't know. Like that that, that intrigues me because Mahashate could just be really, really bad, in which case Garcia, his style should produce points. He has a, a pretty high ceiling as well. Someone like McKenna um I'm gonna be less high on only because th there's still some unknowns here and, and for the 7.2k she's a fine target I, I kind of expect her to be relatively popular I think she's fight, gonna be extremely popular which concerns me and when I watch Vlismus I actually think Vlismus is a, is a really good prospect her she has one loss that came on the ground to Conejo but you watch that fight and it's all it's head and arm throw. So it's a very specific technique that McKenna is not going to employ. So it's like, could Vlismus still lose on the ground to a different style of wrestler than she's lost in the past? Yes. But her loss to Conejo in her debut from a very specific type of grappling doesn't lead me to believe that she's going to fall short against a totally different type of wrestling here. And in fact, you know, like in her last fight, she defended what five, seven takedowns against a more traditional style wrestler that that McKenna will, will will duplicate. So I kind of 
I think Vlismas is going to win that fight. There's there's a little bit of unknowns there, and I wouldn't be totally stunned if she gave up a couple takedowns. But um, McKenna is not the type that I would gravitate toward heavily, especially if she's going to also be very popular. Fokran Dinov, as a third example, is someone who I am very interested in because he's shown times in the UFC and out of the UFC that 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 his game his game plan is wrestling he he's an aggressive wrestler he's fighting a bigger opponent who's skillful on the feet I think sure he could stand and strike with battle for a while but he really needs to get this fight to the ground and how does a win look for him I think it's gonna be several takedowns landed lots of control and in in a mid-range price tag especially when you know, I'd say his ownership would be moderate at, at, at best. Like that's a fight. That's a fight and a fire that interests me because if Fakhradinov wins, I know what, what his style is going to look like. Um, I think he's very likely to exceed value at that price tag. And I just think he has a very realistic chance of winning because we've seen battle. Um, we've seen battle give up takedowns to relatively weak competition in the past. I, I like well, battle as a, Go yeah, ahead. yeah. Let, let me interrupt you there because that, that's an interesting point I wanted to 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 to, to latch on to. Somebody who was really smart mentioned this to me in um uh in, in Twitter like a long time ago when I first started playing MMA. Um w- when you have these forget the, the the old adage of styles make fights, right? Fair enough, right? But you sometimes have these situations where the wrestlers go against the wrestlers, right? And, and, and when those happen, what you get from the DFS community is, is usually something like, like, oh, I'm a genius. Uh, these two wrestlers are just going to just cancel each other out and it's going to have big striking. Okay. It could play out that way, or it could play out with one guy just a little bit better than the other one at it. And the other guy has nothing else to go to. And he just gets swarmed. It was like, uh, I think Ricky Simone was in some fight that kind of looked like that or something like that. I forget. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're dealing with like wrestler with wrestlers against you know strikers against grapplers, do you not to say do you need, but how important is it that the striker have bad takedown defense also? You know what I mean? Like, is it good enough that the wrestler is a wrestler against the like average guy, or do you really need the, the 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 striker to have bad takedown defense? It depends on the situation. Okay. I mean, it depends on the situation. Like, if if. If a fighter is, you know, very expensive and very highly okay, owned versus right. inexpensive and not highly owned, but obviously it makes me more confident when I see a fighter who has weak takedown defense because I can sort of project the the wrestler to have success. And even more importantly than the takedown defense, it's there there's some very basic concepts, again, which I've done videos on in the past about mm-hmm. it's really not that hard to get back up to your feet. Like it's easy for me to say, but the 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 techniques you use to get back up to your feet they're not that complex and so if i go back in tape and i see a fighter who has been in a situation where they just completely had no idea what to do and they got held down for five minutes in a five minute round i'm going to be pretty confident that if they get taken down again they're still just not going to know what to do versus if i see on tape a fighter using proper underhook concepts getting back up to their feet I'm going to be a little more cautious because, well, now, even if my wrestler does land takedowns, I've already seen the opponent kind of understand how to get back up. And that, that can scare me off depending on the circumstance. Two more, two more things. One, one, one thing I think is it really interesting about this slate and it, 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 it corresponds to my talk about, about biases and, and just seeing where the, where the public just flocks, right. Is you have all these different wrestlers as an option, and so you don't have to pick one of them. It's not like there's one guy that you have to pick. So you have your choices. And and I will say this, that I have not seen as much hate for a, a $7,500 fighter with ups, with wrestling upside than Deron Wayne this week. Okay? Like, yeah. I've heard, like, the best I've heard is he doesn't belong in the UFC. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I've heard that he doesn't deserve to live. I mean, like, what <laughs> what, is, what on earth is going on here? I mean, I have, like, yeah. Marquez, like, easily going to, like, Submit, you know, stuff this, stuff that. Yeah. Deron Wayne, he just wants to be Donald Cormier. He just has nothing. All, all, listen, I promise you that if there were like six other wrestling options on this slate, I think the two would be just a little different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that he's only a 160 underdog, mm-hmm. and there ain't no way he's winning absent, you know, a bunch of yeah. a bunch of takedowns. So I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's it, again, this is this is what I'm 
this is what I'm gathering, you know, um, I guess I don't need you to comment on that, but it's, it's something that I've just noticed. Well, I mean, that, that fight specifically, just as an example, I mean, look, when is five foot six and he's fighting at middleweight, it, it, he, he's so incredibly outsized every single time he's shown striking weaknesses. He's shown cardio weaknesses. He's shown defensive grappling weaknesses. He's just not very good. But he has a, a pretty solid wrestling background. We know what his path to victory is. It's landing a number of takedowns. So for me personally, I look at this fight and there's there's no chance that I'm picking Darren Wynn to win. But at 7.5K, I think he's a totally respectable tournament option, a fighter who I definitely would want to have exposure to because I know if Wynn wins, it's going to come from a high volume of takedowns control in theory he just has no other path to victory that i can see and he's facing an opponent in marquez who's probably going to be popular who's given up four takedowns four yeah. takedowns five yeah. takedowns so it just like it doesn't take a genius to be like oh, okay win could land four takedowns in this fight and then how certain are you from there that he just doesn't win two rounds and win the fight at 7.5k at a relatively low ish ownership with that kind of ceiling I think Wynn is a very good fantasy target. From a matchup analysis perspective, I, I have to pick Marquez. I think even if Wynn does land takedowns, he just he's not a good submission grappler. So his, his top game isn't going to be very meaningful. He's going to put him, himself in danger of getting submitted, which I think is probably going to be the end result here. And so I, I'm picking Marquez to win inside the distance. I like Marquez as a tournament play. I think it's a really good fight to target. But you know, price wise ownership, they factor into it. And, and yeah, I'm never going to ignore a, a fighter who's landed what 12 takedowns in, in, in three rounds before. That's just crazy upside to, to ignore, expe especially at, like you said, plus one fifty to win. You know, you know, what's interesting. And, and this is something if you uh, I encourage everybody to, to subscribe to daily fan of MMA and, and to listen to his, his videos and one of the things that you that you talk about a lot when you do your breakdowns is something you kind of alluded to it this time and this is kind of a testament to the fact that you do have uh knowledge outside of the efficient market is is you sometimes will talk about a fight and you'll say okay he's got a he's plus 300 inside the distance which theoretically makes him a good play but he said, i'm just not doing it you know what i mean I, you don't say it exactly like that yeah. and that's it's it's kind of interesting that, that, that like the fights are not actually played out on the spreadsheet you know it, it's uh um right. i mean you want to talk a little more about that i mean do you do you feel as though again that you're that you're that you're i don't want to say it hurts you it doesn't hurt you but do you feel that you're that you are that you're i'd say biases that your knowledge to use a more mm -hmm. positive word like impact your ability your, your impact your separating plays like that I mean, it, it's really hard. It's a really hard thing to do because betting and DFS are way different. And right. and I, you know, ever, I want to think that I know a lot. And right. but I'm very. I always try and learn from people. And like to play DFS at a high level, you do have to kind of take odds at face value to a degree. Right. If you're sitting here being like, "Oh, this fight's wrong. This line's wrong," every single time, it's just you're you're gonna get you're going to get beat out, I think. And I mean, that's not the best way to describe it, but it's important to kind of take odds at a face value. And so I, I try and find this balance between kind of playing DFS correctly, because in, in almost every other sport, lines are super efficient and you, you, you're you not going to have these great edges. But then also I put in all this work of analyzing the fights themselves. I do think I understand matchup analysis more than the majority of the market. And so sometimes, you know, I'll give my opinion. And obviously I ultimately want to let the, you decide what you want to do. I'll say personally, yeah. even though this, this is suggestive of a great play, I, I might shy away because I just don't feel it here for this reason. And it's kind of like, you can lean toward the, the matchup analysis side, or you can just blindly play Lexi Jick at minus 145 inside the distance because he rates out very well. It's, and I, you know, I, I want people to make their own decisions there ultimately. In in the NBA, the the projection models are so so sharp that what happens in the NBA is you could have a guy who projects to be like five X or something, and then he is sixty percent owned, and he puts up two fantasy points, hmm. and then the next time he's in the same situation the next day, he'll have to be the same price, 
He'll be 60% owned again. He'll put up two fantasy points. And then the following day or two days later, we'll think that, okay, because of his last two, two, two performances, people will ignore him and they just don't care. They'll play him again. They're very sharp with respect to ignoring recency in the NBA. Whereas MMA, it seems that, I guess just because of a lack of samples, right? You don't have like a million samples in a row that wild swings happen, fight to fight of of the perceptions of, of, of some of these fighters. And remember when you have MMA, it's like, it's so variant, you know, like if you're, think about this, if your knuckles are, are, are one centimeter a, a different way, you know, and you knock the guy out instead of missing, you're now minus 300 in your next fight, as opposed to then maybe cut from the UFC. Oh, exactly. UFC, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I wonder how much, again, you can't quantify this, but like you talk about recency bias and you talk about, I don't know, let's, how about the, um, you, we mentioned uh, Velismus, for example, like, okay, so, so Velismus going into that fight against Montserrat, whatever, I mean, you know, she was a minus, she was minus 500 or whatever she was. She was huge favorite in that. Like you said, she, 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 she got in a really, really tough spot. Um, she even knew that that's what she, that what she was going to do. And, yeah. and, it's, and it didn't matter. And then, you know, in her next fight, you know, or what is it? Two fights later. I mean, she had that incredible performance. Um, you, and, and I don't know, like, it's hard to, it's hard to not because they're man on man women, it's hard to not get emotional about these things because they're like all well, the spreadsheets. But if you look at the at the freaking interview after that, you know, like she was like basically broke on the street. You know, she had to take a loan to like to, to stay in Vegas. I mean, I know they're there. These are just all people on a spreadsheet or stuff. But I don't want to. I don't want to bet against somebody like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. it's it's it's. But 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 the point I was making is that is that. You get one fight that just turns everything just kind of on its head. And I, the, the fight I, I was thinking about is you have a guy like, like a Rosa, like, like he went into his last fight as probably the most, not the most, liked. I mean, he was the underdog that, that everybody, well, if everybody didn't actually recommend him, they all said they did after the fact, right? <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's something else. But yeah. he was like a very logical underdog and boy, oh boy, did he smash the crap out of, out of out of uh, out of Dawadu and really mm. really paid off and, and I, I, I and I just wonder you know what I mean like I just wonder what this what what this would look like otherwise you know I don't well, know right I mean a perfect example of that I'll go back to this the the Mahashate guy you know he yep. he was yep. an okay. under underdog in his UFC debut in yep. a fight that was projected to, to, to just end quickly he won by knockout his box score is 100 one fight yep. 113 points what would his odds look like if he had yep. lost that fight? Right. You know, yep. He would be a, a huge underdog here. I'm certain of it. And he would not be very popular, but now he's what plus one fifteen. He's got a good inside the distance line. He probably projects to be a popular tournament play. It's just hard because he's fought one time and you don't get these massive samples like you do in other sports. And um, like I, Despite Vlismus losing to Conejo, I was on her against Apollo. I was. Oh, you were on that. Oh, that's great. That was. I uh, think so. I think I better against Martin too. I wasn't really heavy on Arosa in that last one, so I was probably the one tout who didn't really recommend him <laughs> that, that heavily. But, um, yeah, that that that's you know, arosa has been around for a long, long time. He he looks good when he wins, and he gets absolutely knocked out cold off, like off somewhat often when he loses and that's the type of thing where even for me i've seen a guy knocked out over and over and over again even by poor competition even on the regional scene it's hard for me to ever be that confident in him winning because i just know that now he's on a three fight win streak now he's going to be popular yep. maybe this is the time it, it the durability trends back the opposite direction so mma is a very very tough sport in that so, sense so so let, let me let me go on two 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 other things one is i want to talk about amir albazi just kind of conceptually because listen, good good for for DraftKings for finally like pricing these you know some of these guys up. You know, you used to get guys that were like a minus eleven hundred that they would keep at ninety two hundred or something like that. <laughs> I mean, like yeah. what are you going to do? So at least they, they made this difficult. And I'll tell you, ninety six hundred guys are kind of tough to to, to to roster. You know, and and when I kind of do my content, I I, I have like these little you know these break points. I'm like, listen, guys, ninety one hundred for example, I want even money inside the distance at least. 
if he doesn't have that, I want wrestling upside and a combination of two. At 9,600, like, I, I really need both. You know what I mean? Like, I, I need inside the distance plus takedowns because what you really need for 9,600 is you need you need takedown on top, ground and pound, strikes, finish. And it's it's almost like in some of these cases, you, you prefer to not even finish in the first round. You know what I mean? Like, you want those uh those Duplessis fights, you know, those uh those yeah. uh, Pierce fights are the ones that can go to the second round at the end. Um, and, and whatever it is, 9,600 is just always tough for me to kind of, kind of stomach because what happens is, is, you know, if they knock them out in the first round in a minute and four seconds, you're probably bust, you know what I mean? Like with, yeah. uh, with, with without whatever. So, you know, um, uh, do, do you, do you, do you think of it that way? Do you think that like guys like that, you, you demand, you know, more than just an inside the distance prop or, or is, is like, let's say the guy was really yeah. minus, minus 30, like 3000 or something like that. Yeah. And an inside the distance prop of minus 140, but he was like, so such a big favorite. He wasn't really a wrestler that you knew the other guy was going to come and just get, just get, just KO'd. Like, yeah. I know it depends on the slate. Listen, it's an 11 game, 11 fight slate. Then sure. Just take the, just take it and run. But on a 15, 14 fight slate, I mean, do you, do you think of it that way? I mean, as, as a jujitsu guy, for example, if someone likes wrestling, do you kind of demand that type of perfection for a 95, 9600? I mean, I, I want them to be more like, for example, compared to Alexa Jick, I, I would prefer a fighter who has grappling upside, who, uh, you know, at fights at a higher pace. And I think probably if you just look historically, going in on 9600 fighters who are also going to be very, very popular is probably not the right call. I think you're probably better off avoiding those types of plays. However, it's it's really difficult because like on a slate like this, you're if you're not playing Albazi, you know, you're you're pivoting to guys who, yeah, who have solid inside the distance line, Lexi Cop, we talked about, Matthews is fine. They're they're all so risky. They all feel so nice. shaky. And Albazi, you get you look at his box score, 107, 112, 79, like and he's the biggest favorite on the slate and he's fighting a debutante it just feels so easy which is why like in you know i feel gravitating toward playing him but then the other side of it is like i look at this matchup i have no idea why albazi is minus 425 or whatever he is hit the competition he's fought in the ufc has been really really bad and now he's fighting an opponent who has to me has looked decent on the regional scene a guy who's a black belt in jujitsu a guy who i've seen him on his back and he's an aggressive submission grappler so i, I just think like okay hmm, if albazi does land takedowns and he gets on top of this jujitsu black belt who i've seen defend himself well i've seen attack well is he really just gonna go out there and, and smash costa that quickly i kind of feel like costa's live in, in theory he has some skills that i like however you're getting a guy who's never fought in the UFC. You're looking at regional tape. You don't know how much stock to put into that. So maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. And and at worst, if I'm in on Albazi, I know that Albazi, if things work out the right way, he's going to be shooting for takedowns. He we know he can win by like he's a he's an okay talent, and I like his style of fighting from a fantasy perspective. So I'm juggling all these things that huh. it it makes it hard. It makes it hard. I, I got. I'm gonna run one one wrestling thing by you after this last topic. Yeah. Which, as we talk about the the the, the Strickland Cannoneer and and the Sarukian is Magulov, and I want to talk about them in this way. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. think that? I mean, the answer has to be yes, but I, I feel as though that DFS players and basically gamblers in general are really not torn. They really want to have money on the best fights. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they want to have money on the main. They want to have DFS money on the main and they want to usually have DFS money on, on the co-main because it's usually a decent amount of time, kind of like one of the better fights. Right. Yeah. And, and so what I feel as though is that these, this co the co-main in general is usually tends to be kind of over because it's not even five rounds. You don't get that boost and people want to play that fight and people want to play the main event for, for, for double reasons. Right. They want to play the main event number one, because it's the main event. And number two, because you have those five rounds, you know, and I, I feel as though in general, those fights should be avoided in, in GPPs um, just because of that ownership, especially 
it may be a case like this where, you know, you're going to have good median outcomes for both of these guys, you, you know, um, but the, the, the big ceilings you know, relative to their ownership might not exactly be there. And then you have the Saruki and Ismagul fight, which, boy, oh boy, I can't wait to see that fight. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's going to be awesome, yeah. you know. But the thing is, you got these two guys. Listen, the, the inside of distance prop is, 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 is for shit, right? And the, the reason why they're both really good, you know, that no one's going to get run over. I mean, that's the theory, at least. No yeah. one's going to get obliterated in this fight. And it's yeah. going to be a great fight that probably, I don't want to say probably bust, but 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 it could. I think, I think yeah. if anything, I, I, I worry it gets under owned at this point. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know. So so how, what do you think about that? What do you think about like co-mains and mains events? Like how do you deal with main event stuff? And I, I don't even talk about late swap. That'll be for another discussion. Yeah. But yeah. But, but 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 what what about that? Like main events in general and even co-main events? Yeah, I mean, main events definitely I give an ownership boost too. I mean, I'll I'll project the main event higher than nearly every other fight week after week. And I think a lot of smart players that I've talked to over the years and recently, they're just not going to be as high on the main events as the public will be. And I think that's a totally reasonable strategy. Sometimes I like the fight as a whole. And obviously the floor is, is stronger than most other fights because of the extra rounds. Um, sometimes I'll like one fighter or the other that I want to be on, but like, you know, on a fight like that and salary is dependent too. If it, if it's right. a, a main event, like, like last week, I was not on the main event at all. I did not like Ankalaev compared to fighters in that range. I wasn't targeting Blahovich. I didn't think it was going to be a, a high paced fight. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of other strong options this week. It's a little more risky because I don't love it. I think probably unless there's a knockout, the main event's not going to score that well, but 8.7 or uh, sorry 7.7 8.5 k i mean it's two guys who, it, <laughs> well like it just it, it, over 25 minutes right. like one guy right. could very realistically win by knockout so i don't want to like completely right. fade it yeah. but I, I do think at least just being cognizant of, of ownerships especially yeah. in the main event and yeah. perhaps even leaning toward the underweight side is is probably the correct strategy especially if you have a large slate where you can look at 12 other fights that are likely to end inside the distance is a perfect opportunity to come in, to come in underweight if the main event projects to be popular. The co-main event, I don't really look at it as much. Right. I think it, they're just popular kind of by default because they're good right. fighters. Right. Like in, in this particular one, I'm struggling kind of like you because I don't actually know how popular they're going to be right. because I look at the fight and I think – this is not a great fight to target on paper no. on either side. No. And as, as we've talked about the wrestling in the past, you know, Demir is Magulov. He defends takedowns at 90% so far. Uh, I mean, could Sarukian have mild wrestling success? Yeah, sure. He's landed a lot of takedowns in the past. He's a quality wrestler. I give him some upside, but the, 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 the path to, like dominating is Magulov on the mat. I just don't know if it's there. And so if he's going to actually be popular, I won't really be on Saruki and I'll be way underweight on him and probably on the fight as a whole. Whereas if it was just a different, different situation in a different co-main event that I liked better, I would have no problem eating the popular chalk. Like we kind of talked about at the very beginning, just dependent on the, the fight itself. I'm going to float an idea that I had past you because we've talked about wrestling quite a bit. Um, and it's it's a big deal because you know it's 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 a big gap between the way it's scored, you know. And and I actually was doing a had this weird video literally. I was I, I walked two and a half miles for work every day, and I was I did like a whole video on this, and I decided to scrap it um, just because like the video was I mean, it had a terrible picture of me, whatever it is. <laughs> anyway, I figured I'd talk about this with you. So, so the, what DFS people forget is that the fighters themselves don't give a crap what their DFS score is. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the fighters do what they do to, to win. Okay. And, and the thing about it is, is that there've been so many cases in the past, you know, year where these fighters that we are not sure whether they are going to go for, for takedowns. Strictly. We, we, we want them to, you know what I mean? We're like, listen, this is your path to victory. If you do this, It'll be good for you, I think, and I know it's going to be good for me. You know what I mean? Because I'm playing DFS, and that's what that's what I want. And then we go on tilt when between these two options, they go for the other one, right? And and you think about this for a second. 
you have these judges that for better or worse, I mean, this is my, my view, is that given the choice between favoring someone who takes a guy down and holds them there, or a guy that punches a dude in the face, they they rather have the guy to punch the guy in the face, you know. And, and think about it for me as like as like as like a person. If I got into a fight with somebody, would I rather somebody wrestle me, take me to the ground, and hold me there for thirty seconds, or punch me in the face? I kind of would rather get taken down and hold for thirty seconds. Yeah, yeah. So, so so the point is is that we've seen so much over the last year that. Then you get into these weird fights. You're, oh my God, the guy with four takedowns, how did he lose? You know, or whatever. You, we see these weird split decisions when you're like, oh my God, how, how did that possible? As I think we're kind of like rooting for the DFS score to, 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 to generate the win. And the reason I bring that up is because you have these fighters. I mean, listen, I don't want to say these fighters aren't dummies, whatever, but these trainers, they have to see what, 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 what's going on. And, and if you have two paths to victory, one that involves taking the guy down and getting, getting booed by the fans, and, and the other, maybe punching the guy in the face, not to mention maybe like quick, you know, maybe fight in the night bonuses and stuff like that, which for these guys is a fortune, right? Maybe they're going to not go for the wrestling as much. So so when you're with these guys that have these choices, you can't really get mad too much that they don't go for the, for the path that you want them to take. No, it's more of, for me, it's more about just optimize, optimizing their, their win condition. I mean, the, the thing is, how many times have you seen a fight where two guys stand and punch each other in the face? There's yeah. an obvious winner and the obvious winner loses because the judges still don't know what they're looking at. Right. Right. It's, right. Whereas if, if one guy's on top of the other for more than 30 seconds, because you mentioned okay. 30 seconds, if it's for right. four right. and a half minutes in a round, right. you know which fighter's winning. So that's kind okay. of like, right. especially if you do have an advantage on the ground, I want to see you guys go for it. But Sean Strickland's a perfect example yeah. in the main event this week. The last time he fought against the, the, the now champion, Alex Pereira, a skilled kickboxer, it's just so obvious that, oh, you should wrestle. No, I'm not going to have a game plan. Strickland says, I'm going to go in there and, and bang, and he gets KO'd immediately. And at, depending on the fighter, you just have to expect that some guys are going to be dummies. It is what it is. If he wants to fight more enjoyable to the fans, I understand. It's not my career. And But then going into this fight against Cannoneer, again, if Strickland wrestled, he, his chances of winning would go up. That's just a fact, in my opinion. He's once again said, I'm not even going to have a game plan. So when I'm projecting the fight, I'm not like, oh, Strickland is is a great, is a very good wrestler, and it's an you know, easy path to victory on the ground. I'm saying I can't project wrestling because we've already seen him right. fail to use that optimal condition in the past. It's totally dependent on the fighter. You have guys out of that same camp, oh. Chris, Chris Curtis last week who won by knockout right. after he won was, was talking about how he is doubling down on his strategy to throw almost no strikes because, you know, being efficient with your strikes matters. Even if the other guy is attempting way more, Someone like that just doesn't get it because it's totally yeah, the opposite of what's absolutely. correct in my opinion. And it just add, ultimately it just adds another layer of variance to the game. And it's why I'm I'm never in my breakdowns, I'm never that well, confident. There's well, always the thing, hesitancy. And the thing is also is 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 listen, you know, you you do jujitsu, you're you've gotten to you know competitive fights in some form. You know, it's it's like you said, it's one thing to to have the game plan, but you you go down into that under the lights and the thing goes on and you know like the old thing you know everybody's got a plan till they get punched in the mouth you know like that mm -hmm. that thing kind of kind of gets rolling on you know you don't and and i made this mistake like last week i had this this genius take i was watching the um the press conference of uh what's his name of, of Dawkins uh against rosenstrup and they were asking Dawkins, you know i'm up by this and the other things are you having a plan he's like well, I'm certainly not going to stand and bang with this guy. I got to be some kind of moron to do that. I'm like, okay, that's good enough for me. So All I right. went, I went, go the distance. I went, I took the plus three to one that it would, that it would go the distance. And then next thing you know, lights go on. The guy loses his mind. You know what I mean? Right. So, so it's not, so listen, the other guy's got to cooperate with your game plan also a little bit, you know? So it's, uh, so it, it's not so easy to like say, this is my game plan. And then when it's, and then, then you get, then you get buried. I mean, like, to then to then continue it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I was kind of on that too. And it, it, Ugh. it is what it is. I, and also it's, I, I don't want to break some negative news here, but someone just messaged me that Darren Wynn has posted that he fell downstairs, hit his head and he's out of the fight. So Save, you know what? Save, save me money. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I know, right? That it's just it's no. For me, that saved me money because because I was going to be the the one the one idiot that actually bet him in the money line <laughs> at a terrible <laughs> yeah. price. So that, at least we know now instead of uh, right. Saturday, thirty minutes before the fight starts, or or, or worse, or or thirty seconds after it starts, which yep. is another. It's, there you go. Which, there you go. Which is which is another discussion. Hey, listen. Th- thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all this. Listen, I I couldn't. Couldn't recommend your, your stuff enough. Uh, for those of you that aren't in there already, go to dailyfanmma.com. I have no idea what it costs really anymore. I don't know if there's a free trial or whatever it is. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm also curious to see how the site develops with respect to the other sports. I'll let you all ask you this with respect to your site. And I yeah. guess with your play in general. So aside from MMA, what, yeah. what is your, your next favorite sport to play? And then slash, what is the next sport you're going to emphasize on your site if those are not the same man i mean i honestly love like playing every sport if i had the time to play, really? okay. play every sport i would like i i just love sports in general i've gravitated more toward the weekly sports just because it's, okay. you have more time to prepare okay. um i have a good friend ryan larkin who i pulled on to do our racing content and and he's sort of like me in the sense that he under, he comes from a racing background. He understands racing. We can mix that with the DFS element together. And that's kind of why we launched racing on the site. So I, I had success in racing this year. I really enjoy it. I love NFL. I'm not that great at it. I mean, I, t- I tend to uh, gravitate to- more toward a cash game mindset in every other yeah. sport, but I love NFL. That's, you know, there, there's a lot of money in NFL. I like PGA. So if I was going to pick more sports in the future, it would be the weekly sports probably NFL PGA. But, but, what, but, but what about your site? The, the, the race racing is the second, uh, is the second point of emphasis there. Yeah. And you can access that directly at dailyfanracing.com. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's yeah, that, that is, and, and it's more just, it was an opportunity for us. I'm not going to like, I don't have any plans to launch sports in the coming months or even the next year. If something okay. fits, then we will pursue it. But um, that was more of a, a situational thing and something ultimately we feel that we can help the racing community from the DFS side. And, and I think we had a really good year. So I was happy. I was happy with, with uh, our, with our uh, chance to, or I was happy with taking a chance on, on racing this year, just despite keeping the the brand name as, as daily fan MMA. <laughs> well, I could, I couldn't recommend his stuff enough. And, and the, the great part is, is like, I, I have to do with this sometime in the next four months, I have a, 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 a California trip I have to make, and and I want to bet from him. Last time we had a thing about uh about uh, whatever that old guy's Olenek's ownership, and, and, Ar- and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna go to we're gonna go to dinner somewhere in San Diego. I have a, I have a really big client who lives in Rancho Santa Fe, so we'll we'll take one uh we'll take one uh, we'll take one uh, when uh, we'll get a drink at some point. But oh, uh, good, but go to daily at fanmma.com. I guess what are you Brett App Appley on on Twitter? Brett App yeah Brett Appley double T double P. Oh, look at that flow off you. Look at that marketing just flow right off your when, tongue. When, when, you, when you say it 100,000 times over That's five right. years, it just rolls, you know? That's right. All right. Good luck, everybody.